Well, this is the penultimate uh, class. So we're uh, almost done. The whole course began um, in the fall of last year, starting with uh, more or less the Neolithic Revolution, which is universally accepted as sort of a, a, a major change point in, in human experience. Um, I've become increasingly skeptical of its um, utility as a starting point. Because <clears throat> it seems to me that by the way the Neolithic Revolution is defined, focusing primarily on grain growing in the Egypt and Mesopotamia and other old world places, that it, um, it fails to look at many of the interesting phenomena that are happening at the same time or uh, roughly the same time in other areas. And therefore, from the very outset, when you take that as the beginning of your narrative, you're preparing the way for a history that gives special uh, legitimacy to the ancient Near East um, and to uh, those things that are now looked upon as being the successors to the ancient Near East, that is say ancient Greece, ancient Rome, then medieval Europe, then modern Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are completely different ways of doing world history where you don't actually intersect these topics very much at all. And um, they don't show up in textbooks because they're not normally adopted for teaching world history. And yet they are, in their own sense, world histories. Uh, there are numerous of them, uh, but I'm particularly concerned with one because I've taught about it in over many years and written about it. And I'm going to give it, talk about it today as an example of an alternative way of conceptualizing uh, world history. And this is to conceptualize the history of the world in terms of how humans live, not with each other, but rather with animals. Um, to do this, you have to create uh, stages and eras and uh, pick out developments, single out important individuals or important places. Same sort of thing you would do for a world history that focused on the political realm or on the, uh, the nature of property relations or something like that. It's just that there'll be different ones because you're talking about humans and animals. Now what strikes me of the, about this as being in some ways a more satisfying way to do world history is that you're not starting at a, um, with a single point and saying, let's zoom in on ancient Egypt or let's zoom in on Mesopotamia or the Indus Valley and talk about river valley civilizations and agriculture where you're being selective from the very outset. Um, the way I look at the history of human-animal relations, as I put it in my book on hunter, herd, hunters, herders, and hamburgers, uh, is that humans initially lived with animals as animals. There was some point at which, if we accept uh, Darwinian theory, there was at some point at which our ancestors um, had no more consciousness of themselves as a, uh, as a distinctive species than a chipmunk does. They, um, they were just an animal. They had uh, animals that they ran away from and animals that they ate and animals that they had sex with and animals that they avoided because they would, you know, would cause them to 
you know, they had, had stingers or it caused them to itch or something like that. But by and large, they didn't even notice the other animals. And when you notice, when you look at animals in, a, uh, in relationship to one another, one of the most interesting things is how little interest they take in one another, unless they're of the same species. That's true there, you can see a nice video of a, of a chimpanzee going and pulling a dog's tail and running away, and that's kind of cute. But by and large, not much interest of, in animals and other animals unless they have some sort of symbiotic uh, relationship or predator-prey relationship. So the first stage in the development of human-animal relations as opposed to simply humans being animals is what I call separation, a process by which uh, some uh, species in our line of, of evolution uh, came to be aware that they were different or that they were distinctive or that they were conscious of themselves as a species and other animals um, uh, were different. In other words, they were people and the other animals were animals. We don't know when this was. Uh, we don't know why it happened. We don't have any, anything other than conjecture to uh, guess at what may have caused uh, early hominids, also I use hominid because we don't know exactly when it occurred, to see themselves as being different from other animals. But we know it happened because we, don't, we, we have a mentality very different from chipmunks today when it comes to looking at at the world, and we see ourselves as separate from animals. That had to start sometime. Now, where it started, uh, that's easier to say. Uh, it almost certainly started in East Africa, because there is, it's very hard to imagine this process not already being uh, in train at the time that modern Homo sapiens sapiens left East Africa uh, some 50,000 years ago and expanded around the world. So I think they took their notion of, of being a distinctive species different from other animals uh, with them. Um, there's no particular indication that they thought other animals were special. They were just different. But over a long period of time, let us say a period of uh, something in the order of uh, 30 or 40,000 years. They gradually thought more and more about, uh, about other animals. And the evidence for this shows up uh, in various ways, but very strongly it shows up in the pictures, the uh, visualizations that humans uh, created uh, from the Paleolithic era onward, let's say, let's say from uh, oh, 40,000 uh, BC onward. Whether you are looking at pictures in Australia or in Ice Age caves in Spain or France, or uh, you know, early artistic remains from almost anywhere in the world that go back let's say over 20,000 years, but even come up much more recently in some areas, uh, the one thing that stands out is that the most common category of image uh, is, uh, is an animal, compared to which the lack of images of plants is extraordinary. It's true you can find, oh, there's a corn plant, or there is a identifiable species of tree, and so forth. But for every identifiable plant, you have hundreds of animal images and almost no human images. Uh, people wanted to make images of animals, uh, but they weren't particularly drawn to making images of themselves or, uh, or other humans. Uh, the presence of animals accelerates as you get closer and closer to the era of the first 
domestic animals. So you have a, um, an intensification of thinking about animals or looking at animals aesthetically. Uh, normally, when these images are looked at, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists are inclined to think that these animals that are shown up are food animals. Now, there's very little evidence of this case. I would say images of an animal being hunted or, or being dead or being carved into pieces, uh, those are extremely rare images. Whereas you may have uh, many, many, many more images that show the animal in motion. Um, and usually in a very uh, majestic uh, fashion. So we don't know whether these were uh, food images. But by the time you get to uh, the first indication of certain animals becoming domestic, it's fairly clear that there is an identification of some animals with supernatural beings. So if you say at the time of separation, humans are saying, you know, we're not animals, we are humans. And animals are just animals. And you go along 30,000 years later, and you have people saying, we're not animals, we're humans, but God is a giant bull, or our lineage descends from kangaroos, or something like that. The, the animals go from being not us, to being elevated above us. Um, and we end up with this uh, very, very strong uh, relationship of animals with, uh, with the supernatural, particularly with, uh, with uh, divinities. We also have a <coughs> plethora of legends and beliefs that surely must go back to a very early point that deal with uh, intersections between humans and animals. That is to say that deal with uh, beings that are part human and part animal, uh, whether it is a werewolf or a centaur or a were llama in Peru or um, uh, whatever it is. I mean, we, people believe that there were uh, intersections between humans and animals. And they also very strongly believed that there were situations in which humans could actually either become animals uh, for, for the time being or kind of channel animals. And this is generally falls into the category considered sh as shamanism. Uh, that is to say, religious beliefs that uh, question the boundary between humans and animals. Um, so you, what, you, what you have with this growing tendency is a boundary issue. Where do humans stop and animals begin? Initially, in the period of separation, that is, how do we rise above animals? And then increasingly, it becomes, uh, what's the boundary between us and animals that are um, more powerful or faster or more beautiful or more um, magnificent and more indicative of, a, of some sort of uh, spiritual quality. Uh, at this point, you know, I, I, I call this, this whole period the period of pre-domesticity, but you're not obligated to use that term. Matter of fact, you're not obligated to remember anything at all. But, um, but at the end of this pre-domestic pre era, uh, various human societies have reached a very extensive level of identification of animals. Um, uh, and it survives in various forms. Uh, for instance, in costumes, uh, the use of feathers, the use of furs, the use of animal masks, um, to have dances that will be imitate, imitative of animals. Uh, ethnographers have found thousands and thousands of, of uh, instances of this sort of 
uh, special um, status of animals uh, that survive uh, down to modern times. Uh, and we don't know when they originated, but it seems likely that they originated uh, tens of thousands of years ago. In economic terms, this period of uh, pre-domestic uh, human-animal relations is often referred to as a period of hunting and gathering. Um, I do not fancy that term because it tends to reduce human-animal relations to economic relationships, to say that hunting is what it's all about, and that the primary concern of the people who painted pictures of bison and horses and lions and so forth on the walls of caves, they, you know, they were there with their, their brush or their stick and a pot of paint, and they were thinking, lunch, lunch, dinner, dinner, um, good hunting, lunch, I really want to eat this. Um, if you look at the species distributions, they don't particularly match the species that were eaten according to the bone uh, census that you could make of certain archaeological sites. They were the animals they wanted to draw rather than ones that they were compelled to draw because they were hungry. And I think that the reduction of this to hunting uh, really relates to the, the strong um, materialist basis of, of the anthropological discipline, which I'm actually quite attuned to in many cases, but not in this. It seems to me that you, you have a, uh, let's say, a rise in the spiritualization of animals. So you get to the point where we think that we're related to animals, we can channel animals, we have gods that are like animals, so on and so on, and then we get the first domestic animals. That that the, rot, that the appearance of domestic animals is at the end of a process um, uh, that is very poorly understood when you look at it purely from the point of view of hunting. When you look at, at this pre-domestic um, spiritualization or elevation of animals, you look at where it happened you find it happens everywhere in the world. Old world, new world, Australia. The importance of animals in the human imagination and in human conceptions of where humans stand in relation to the, uh, to the animals that they live amongst. Uh, that increasing focus on animals uh, occurs everywhere. Then you get to this point where you have the first domestic uh, species. And what's, what's so striking is that uh, this does not occur everywhere. This is very rare. There are only a few places where you, uh, where you have the emergence of domestic animal species. Um, people who talk about the Neolithic Revolution as the beginning point for a world historical narrative, say, well, this is when you have the emergence of domestic plants and animals, uh, which is not correct, because you have places that have domestic plants that do not have domestic animals. This would be true, say, of the precocious civilizations in the New World, in Peru and Mexico. Other places where you have domestic animals, but uh, but you don't have domestic plants. This would apply, say, to the early cattle herding cultures of the Sahara and the Sahel area south of the Sahara. Uh, there is really no relationship uh, intrinsic to the, uh, to the business of uh, domestic plants and animals. It's rather a carryover from the concept of hunting and gathering that if you have a foraging community, which is the term I would prefer, uh, foragers uh, gather plant life and hunt animal life. Therefore, if you move to a different stage 
in world history where people are uh, harvesting deliberately planted plants, then it seems proper that they, are, that they now move from hunting to harvesting animals that are domestic animals. So there's a certain logic to it, but it's a logic that isn't born of, a, of an examination of the actual processes, um, but rather is kind of a continuation that you go from uh, hunting and gathering to domestic plants and animals without asking whether that makes any particular sense. And I would argue it doesn't make any particular sense. There is a, uh, a, a large library of literature dealing with the emergence of domestic animals. And it's, um, it does not converge onto a, uh, onto a very plausible uh, scenario. We don't know how animals came to be domestic. My own feeling is that each species uh, became domestic in its own way, that you don't have a process that was a replicatable process that occurred with species A, species B, species C, and so forth. This is not the common view. The common view is that um, humans tried to, domestic everything, to domesticate all animals and only succeeded in a very small number of cases, uh, those cases being therefore uh, uh, designated as the only animals that could be domesticated. And yet nobody knows what the process was. Uh, the, the great uh, structuralist anthropologist uh, Claude Levi-Strauss Post, uh, you know, observed quite correctly that if you had some animals, or indeed if you had some plants, but let's stick with the animals. If you had some animals that were wild animals, um, and you wanted to domesticate them, but you had never seen a domestic animal, how could you want to domesticate it? How could you visualize that this wild animal might become a domestic animal when you didn't know what a domestic animal was. Uh, you know, in the first instances, there can be no question but what domestication was an unanticipated, an unanticipatable outcome of things that people had no grasp of. Now, Lady Strauss says we must assume that the people who lived at this at this juncture, um, had a scientific spirit that led them to try experimenting with different groups of animals to see what would happen. And then, lo and behold, some of them became domestic. At which point, the scientific spirit disappeared, not to reappear until the 18th century in Western culture. Uh, and he's, he, he talks about this as the savage mind, that there was a, a basic orientation toward experiment, toward um, trying things to see what would happen that must have existed, because otherwise, otherwise, how could you account for certain uh, groups of animals becoming domestic? At the other end of the scale, <clears throat> which is um, closer to where I am in my thinking, you have the idea that animals uh, became domestic um, uh, by themselves. The animal that is most frequently held up as an example of self-domestication is the cat. The earliest cats seem to come from uh, probably from Egypt. The earliest cat bones come from Cyprus, um, but Cyprus has no wild species from which the cat could have uh, derived. Therefore, the domestic cat had to already be there and be brought to Cyprus by people in order to have those bones appear. So we don't have bones going back to the earliest phases of Egyptian society, but there's 
uh, a strong er argument made that it more or less co coincides with the, uh, with the beginnings of agriculture in Egypt. And the notion of self-domestication is that when people started to grow grain uh, and plant grain, it meant that every time they harvested a crop, they stored a very substantial portion of the crop. Uh, they stored it so they would eat it during the fallow, year, the fallow months of the year, and so they would have, uh, and so that they would have seeds left to plant at the beginning of the next plant, planting season. Uh, this stored grain uh, attracted rodents. Uh, the rodents uh, were the favorite uh, prey of small uh, of small cats who were native to uh, to North Africa. Uh, and indeed, there are cats that are really almost indistinguishable in size and and shape to uh, from from domestic cats. You can go to zoos and see them. Uh, so you had cats that came into the community uh, because human communities were full of mice and rats and other uh, grain-eating uh, vermin. And the humans were happy to have uh, the cats eat the vermin as long as they didn't eat their babies, uh, as long as they didn't think of the humans as being, um, you know, objects that they should attack. So the logic of it here is that when you had cats that came into the human community to eat the mice and the rats, any of those cats that, was, uh, that appeared to be ferocious was clubbed in the head by the people and killed. Um, so the result was the cats that were not, uh, that were not killed were the most docile of the cats. And they're the ones that we produced. And after a certain number of generations, they're the ones that become the parent stock of domestic cats. Because generation after generation, only the most docile of the cats in the village will be allowed to live. The others will be killed or driven off. Then once you have pussy cats, that you can trust to you know, purr and rub up against you for food and so forth, uh, then there's no need for the wild cats because you now have a domestic cat. So then you drive off all of the wild cats. And now you have domestic cats and you breed them. But you don't know how you, why, why you got them. They just suddenly appeared. And it occurs over a long enough period of time that nobody would have had a memory of uh, of the first wild cats coming into the village. Because we're talking about, oh, apparently something like 30 generations before you get a completely, uh, completely docile uh, pussycat. Once you have domestic cats, then they spread. Um, it isn't that, you ha that people go through this process everywhere. Because once you have cats, then you spread the cats. Uh, why? Because they eat the mice and the rats. So when you look at, say, the history of China or Japan, um, the evidence would appear to indicate that cats appeared in East Asia um, because they were kept in Buddhist monasteries uh, to kill the mice and the rats. Uh, but they were not known in ordinary uh, uh, human settlements. They were brought in because the Buddhists expanded eastward from, uh, from Afghanistan and India and brought the Middle Eastern cats with them. So according to this theory, cats become domestic without anyone knowing what's happening. The same argument is made in the case of pigs and dogs. Uh, pigs and dogs are uh, scavengers, um, or they are at least scavengers in part. That means they eat uh, 
waste and garbage and so forth and so on. And there was nothing as full of garbage as a human campsite. So just as the, the grain growers uh, had grain that the mice and rats ate, going back apparently thousands of years earlier, uh, human settlements had garbage in them. And the rats and the pigs, or the uh, dogs and the pigs, would come uh, and eat the garbage. And if the dogs were ferocious, the humans killed them. If the pigs were ferocious, the humans killed them. But those that were sufficiently docile were allowed to stay in the village because it's always good to have some, some way to get rid of your garbage. This is very different from the idea that humans domesticated dogs, or domesticated wolves, I should say, you know, for hunting purposes. It's very little indication that dogs were used for hunting in a, uh, you know, in their earliest, uh, in their earliest uh, domestic incarnations. Uh, of course, we don't know. Uh, we 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 can say that the humans hunted, but we don't really know whether they hunted using the skills of the dog, or whether the dog went on the hunt to get the garbage. Uh, the only place where we have some reasonable indication is in Australia, where you had uh, Aboriginal peoples who arrived in Australia 40,000 years ago. Dogs arrived somewhere around 12,000 years ago. We don't know how. And so you had dogs in Australia that were the only species that, of mammals, because the others were, uh, were marsupials, all the native fauna. So here you have one uh, full mammalian species. And in the Australian uh, language, this becomes the dingo, uh, which is a, a dog that lives with humans, but also uh, is feral. And to say it, it runs wild in many occasions, as opposed to being uh, unchanged from the wild. Uh, so there have been people who have looked at what is the relationship between aboriginals, aboriginal people and dingoes. When the dogs came, did the aborigines, uh, who, were, who were there before without dogs, did the aborigines draw the dogs into their hunting environment? And the answer appears to be no that uh, the dogs would go with the aboriginal hunters so that if something was killed, the dogs would have something to eat. But they weren't used for tracking. They weren't used for attacking. They weren't used for protecting. They were there essentially to, uh, to scarf up the garbage. Uh, they were also used um, as pets. Uh, one specific that was rather surprising was that you have aboriginal groups that will break the legs of young dogs so that they will be lame and unable to run away. So they'll have to stay in the human community and eat the garbage. But they also are used, you know, if, if it gets cold and you have a campfire and it's burned down but you have gone you know, down to coals on the night, if you're lying there on the ground, the side of you that's facing the fire is warm, and your butt is cold. So it's been observed that a dingo will be pulled up, particularly with old ladies. You know, come on, you cut up behind me and keep my butt warm, um, because, of course, this is what wives do with their husbands as well, but it's um, uh, the, uh, the dog appears to be um, uh, a giver of comfort uh, by warmth and a satisfier of emotional needs as a pet. And this sort of, yeah, we have large areas of the world where feral dogs are not used for anything at all. In Japan, uh, if you go back to the 18th century, there were lots of dogs um, and they were often in a village but they weren't owned by anybody. 
But they were useful because if somebody came to the village, the dogs would bark. So they were not watchdogs, but they let you know what was going on. Um, but nobody owned the dogs. Uh, they weren't used for hunting. They weren't uh, pets. They were just there. India, the so-called pariah dogs, uh, again, they were just there. So it's true that there are hunting peoples who use dogs for hunting, but dogs in general do not seem to have a clear lineage as hunters. I think they do have a clear linea lineage, lineage as uh, scavengers of garbage. Uh, pigs, a little bit different because you have two different patterns with pigs. A pattern that seems to emanate from Southeast Asia, where pigs primarily lived in villages and ate garbage. And another pattern that seems to be most common in Southeast Europe, which is where pigs live in the forest and eat nuts. Um, and but we don't have a very clear notion of domestic process with pigs, except probably they were domesticated in numerous places. And if the, uh, if the Native Americans in the United States had been inclined to have a domestic animal, one of the easiest animals they, uh, they would have had available to domestic uh, is the javelina, uh, also known as the peccary, which is a wild animal in North America, particularly in the Southwest. You still have a lot of javelinas around. And it's, a, it's not of the same genus as pigs, but it, it looks like a pig, it acts like a pig, it, uh, it would serve the function. And when the Europeans came, they said, you know, this animal is easy to, to domesticate. It, uh, it's tasty. Uh, it doesn't mind being around people. But we already have pigs, so we don't need another pig. So the peccary never gets domesticated. Yeah, you can go species by species and find patterns of domestication uh, that uh, do not add up to a single process. And I don't think there ever was a process of domestication. Uh, the animals that we know most about are cows, sheep, goats, and uh, around 8,000 uh, BC, 10,000 years ago, and about uh, five or 6,000 years ago, uh, horses, and to a lesser degree, donkeys and camels. Uh, these species are better attested, and it's normally thought that you domesticated these species, or humans domesticated these species, in order to get meat. Now there's a problem with that, because supposing you go and you kill a wild, uh, a wild cow, and you bring home the baby cows, um, do you eat them, uh, or do you keep them around until they have babies? And then do you eat those babies? And wh when do you eat them? There's something very sort of um, Calvinist about the whole thing. You bring in back to the camp a, a lamb or a calf, a docile uh, infant, and you think, I could have lamb chops or, you know, veal parmesan um, tomorrow. Or I could wait two years and then I could have it. But then, you know, if I want to keep it, maybe I should wait four years. Maybe I should take 12 years and I have a whole herd, then I can have a lot of lamb chops. You know, this notion that you put off until years in the future, the pleasure of meeting you might have now, uh, doesn't make much sense. Um, unless, of course, you are getting enough meat from hunting that you have no need, no need to eat the little ones that you're keeping around the camp. But then what do you keep them around the camp for? Um, what is striking about kind of the earliest phase of the domestication of cattle, sheep, and goats is the, uh, the overlap between these domestic species and, um, and sacrifice. <coughs> 
by and large, on a worldwide basis, human groups do not sacrifice wild animals. Sacrifice here meaning to deliberately kill the animal uh, in a ritual situation um, with some conception that you are doing so in relationship to, uh, to supernatural beings or some sort of uh, supernatural situation. Now you don't do it with wild animals for a fairly obvious reason. That if you have chased an antelope down and you've killed it, then you can't sacrifice it because you've already killed it. The alternative is to chase down the, am am the antelope, uh, kidnap it, drag it home, and then sacrifice it when you get home. Well, the antelope may really disagree with that. <laughs> uh, you know, bringing wild animals into the camp for the purpose of sacrificing them uh, really makes almost no sense, unless, of course, they are young. If they're young, then you can bring them in. If they're just kids or calves, uh, fawns. But the grown animals you can't sacrifice, um, particularly because some of them are very dangerous. The only wild animal that gets sacrificed uh, with some uh, repetition is the bear, because bears are pretty docile, unless, they, of course, they get angry at you. Um, and you can keep a bear for six months or a year and then sacrifice it when it's bear killing time. But by and large, the only animals that you can, that you can sacrifice on a reliable basis are the ones that you already have. So maybe they brought in the young cows or sheep or goats and didn't avail themselves of the lamb chops or the veal chops right away because they thought, we'll save these for a special occasion. You know, when there's a drought and we need rain, we'll sacrifice uh, one of these animals and God will bring rain or something like that. There's a high correlation between sacrifice and domestic animals. In the process of a sacrifice, what normally happened was that uh, under ritual conditions, often with chanting and so, and so forth, uh, an animal would be killed and then the animal would be cooked and select portions would be cooked under circumstances where the aroma or the smoke or the flesh were supposed to please the god. And the rest would be a barbecue. So once sacrifice begins, it's, it's really basically a barbecue uh, situation where you kill an animal and you socialize the meat. So the person who has the animals is the one who is the great man of the village because he's the one who can give meat to the whole village. Uh, in Indian culture, he was called the Yajamana, the, uh, the person who provides the animals uh, for, for the sacrifice. You have another group of ritual specialists who chant the hymns, the Yajamana. Yajamana doesn't do anything. He just sits there while the animal is being sacrificed and then presides over uh, the meat being given away. Um, so the, the owners of animals become identified as the, the meat givers for the community. Uh, if you give a lot of meat and you say, you know, you've all come here and you've all eaten all my meat and I'm happy to have you here, happy to entertain you, and I'd like you to call me king from now on. Uh, now you have the origin of kingship. It's it may have a little more complicated than that, but not a whole lot because the provision of meat is very different from the provision of, uh, of vegetable stuff. Uh, you know, you did not have people who, who grew wheat and, you know, let's say made uh, unleavened bread, said, all right, bread for everybody. You know, because everybody was growing wheat. They made their own bread. It wasn't a big deal. But throughout history, uh, hunting and royalty have been very, very closely conjoined. And hunting comes to be seen as an analog for war, but also a 
ruler is seen as a great ruler, partly in relationship to his prowess in hunting, as shows up in images. Going back to uh, 3000 BC, the image of the king killing animals. You don't have parallel images of the king planting crops. No, here's Aser Nasser Pal plowing. You don't see that. Now there are some famous uh, legendary rulers who were, who were associated with the bringing of agriculture. The Yellow Emperor in China or Jamshid in the Persian tradition, but by and large, it's the, uh, it's the animal keepers who become the prototype of the, uh, of the monarchy. Um, why did they sacrifice? One of the most common ethnographic findings of uh, modern uh, foraging communities is that Killing animals uh, brings, into, brings the killer into a state of guilt, that the animal's spirit is offended by being killed either individually or uh, as a species. So you have time and time again examples of rituals, prayers or sayings in which hunters apologize to their prey for killing them. Apologize to their prey and say, we're only killing you because we need, we need the food. Um, and this is part of this growing tendency to aestheticize and sacralize animals that you have in the late uh, point before you start getting domestic animals. So sacrifice is a continuation of that. It is not that you sacrifice the animals as an apology to the animals, but you sacrifice the animals as a, uh, you ritualize the sacrifice in order to gain the forgiveness of some higher spirit for, for killing the animals. And you don't limit it to what you want to eat. Instead, the sacrifice, unlike hunting, is unlimited. The more animals you can provide, the greater the sacrifice. So. You know, in the Iliad, where you have hecatombs, uh, meaning a hundred cattle sacrificed, uh, we think literally that you had hundreds and hundreds of animals that were sacrificed, and that uh, by the time of the, um, let's say, by the time of Jesus, virtually all meat that was available in the cities of the Roman Empire uh, came from the temples. It was all sacrificed meat because producing meat without a ritual situation was considered uh, wrong. It, incidentally, you, you think of this and then you think of how uh, when Cain and Abel present the first fruits of their endeavors, God prefers the first fruits of, um, of Abel, who is the animal herder, to the first fruits of Cain who's the grower of grain. And so Cain kills Abel out of jealousy. Uh, the animal keeper in this social situation uh, is supreme. But it means that this pattern of hunting animals uh, in, in sacred situations isn't necessarily a universal feeling. What seems to be universal is the idea that you apologize to the animals, the idea that you that it becomes divinized at a higher level uh, seems to be geographically uh, narrower. So in areas where you have animals that could, be, uh, could become domestic, say North America where you could domesticate bison or, or caribou, uh, it never happens uh, because domestication is not a practical thing. It's not an economic thing. It is initially a uh, something that is part of the social functioning of the group with respect to the acquisition of meat. Most people in the world over most uh, early periods were perfectly happy just to eat meat that was gained by hunting or fishing. Uh, the idea that you should grow your own meat, which we take as almost a defining factor of civilization, 
is a very uncommon idea. Uh, and you have even modern societies that really have never taken to the idea of growing animals for food. Japanese society down to World War II uh, ate primarily uh, the produce of the sea uh, and, not, and not whales. Uh, wh whales never been that popular in Japan. Um, so, uh, so you have this, this domestication that, in my mind, is pretty much a continuum along here. That is to say, as you get more myths, more legends of human-animal relations, more questioning of the spiritual boundary between humans and animals, more sacralization and so forth, the domestication comes in at this juncture in certain areas that happen to have certain uh, religious or ritual uh, practices. The animals were only used for that. There is, you know, sheep. If you go back to um, 10,000 years ago, uh, people had domestic sheep, but there was no wool. Uh, wild sheep don't have wool. So wool comes along later as what uh, one major scholar, Andrew Sherratt, calls a secondary utility. There apparently is a lapse of time of uh, several thousand years before there are types of sheep that have wool. There's a lapse of time of several thousand years before people start to drink milk. It's a lapse of time of several thousand years before people start to use animals to plow. Now, all these things are now classified as secondary utilities because we have fairly concrete evidence of when wool and plowing and milking come in, and it's not until well after the first archaeological evidence of domestication. So what, what we end up with is that when you have domestic species of these uh, major uh, quadrupeds, Initially, let's say if you have an axis here of um, um, O uh, graphing uh, spiritual importance or uses against economic utility. Initially, you'd have a pretty high level for ritual or sacredness of animals and a fairly low level of utility because you're still getting uh, much or most of your animal protein from animals that you're hunting. Uh, over time, particularly as secondary utilities are discovered, the, the economic utility goes up and the spiritual utility goes down. Uh, the study of, of human-animal relations pretty much comes in at this point, at a point where it's assumed that domestic animals are primarily useful. And indeed, there may be people who, will, who would sort of say uh, domestic animals are useful animals. So even animals that are born wild like elephants become useful and therefore talk about domestic elephants, even though they're not born in captivity. Uh, whereas the spiritual side of animals gets to be um, uh, relegated to insignificance because uh, that is seen to be primitive and savage and uh, unacceptable. So that sacrifice, blood sacrifice, tends to disappear uh, or to become metaphorical. Uh, gods that have human characteristics uh, blended with animal characteristics are supplanted by gods that are entirely human. Um, notions like uh, werewolves and centaurs are written off as myths. And shamanism, where you have a priest who tries to channel an animal spirit, is considered to be uh, a sign of savagery. Instead, you have uh, economic utility as being the overwhelming uh, uh, property of animals. The, the, what this means is that the division between domestic animals and wild animals, uh, which is rather slight 
at this beginning point uh, because you've spiritualized your wild animals and you're coming off of that period. Uh, that becomes greater and greater. So by the 17th century, um, the smartest people in Europe, uh, according to the, uh, to the modern index of smart people in Europe, um, that is say the first enlightenment geniuses, um, began to think that animals are simply machines, that they are 100% uh, uh, economically useful entities, and they have no spiritual uh, or um, uh, affective characteristics at all. This is particularly associated uh, with the thinking of, um, of Descartes, who wrote it in numerous of his writings about how animals are simply uh, God's cuckoo clocks. Um, humans can make uh, a mechanized device, and God makes mechanized devices that are simply cleverer than the human ones. But like the human ones, they have no feelings, they have no memory, they have no anticipation, they have no, uh, they have no spirit. Uh, and therefore, if you want to find out how medicine operates or surgery, you simply cut open an animal. And you certainly don't worry, care, care if the animal uh, screams or cries, because God designed it that way. It's like having a cuckoo clock that when you, if you open the front door, it goes, ah, don't, don't take me apart. You know, it, it's, just, uh, it's just an illusion. There's no pain. Because you have to, you know, one of the things that happens in here, uh, in this span of time, the notion that humans are totally different from animals comes to be um, the doctrine in societies where you have domestic animals. You know, initially you had humans separating themselves from animals. Then they begin in the late pre-domestic period to, uh, to develop rather elevated feelings about animals. And now they've made the difference between animals and humans has become absolute, sanctioned, of course, by the Bible, by the Koran, uh, as the two major uh, books of the most of the societies that most heavily use domestic animals. Um, and wild animals retain a certain amount of nobility. So the notion of hunting a hunting big game still has a certain cachet because only a mighty hunter can hunt big game. But to slaughter a sheep, um, well, that's kind of like, you know, uh, opening a hungry man dinner. Uh, it's, it has, the sheep has no more feeling than that, uh, than that microwavable plate of food does. Um, in other parts of the world, this did not occur. And th there are other things that do occur. And the most, uh, the most common one, of course, is that people do not consume much in the way of meat from domestic animals, but rather they continue to hunt and fish and they may have a few domestic animals, like the, uh, like the dwarf goats of sub-Saharan Africa. But, uh, but by and large, um, they don't eat very much meat. Uh, and what they get from hunting and fishing is, is sufficient. But then you have another important subculture that occurs within the domestic arena. And that consists of pastoral nomads who keep tens and th of thousands of animals of the same species normally. Uh, and they, they herd them and they see to their, uh, to, to their survival, lead them to food and water and so forth and so on. And these domestic uh, herds uh, do not really yield a whole lot of meat um, because they are valuable in and of themselves. They exist as property, uh, like gold coins or uh, jewels or, uh, you know, uh, euros. <laughs> um, they exist as property, and if you spend it, you don't have it. Well, spending it with an animal means that, that it's dead. Now you're eating it. You're eating it, but, but now you, your property has been diminished. <clears throat> 
So they tend to hold animals, often way in excess of those that are easily uh, sustained by the ecosystem they are in. Uh, they hold those animals because they are indicators of wealth. Uh, they consume secondary products uh, like um, you know, wool or hair or um, uh, milk. But they don't eat a lot of the animals. Uh, obviously, you only have pastoral nomads in areas that have domestic animals, uh, but also have enough space that is not readily usable for agriculture to have a free ranging space for these animals. So let's say then that you have, by the time you get to, oh, uh, 1800 or so, you have animals are in certain categories. One category is um, entirely utilitarian. Uh, you grow animals, uh, you cut them up, you fry them, you eat them. Another one is that you grow them as a pastoral nomad. They are wealth. You sustain them, but you don't kill them a lot. And another one is that you really don't have much in the way of domestic animals, that you use the animals and the fish that you have uh, have in your environment. Um, there's a turning point that sets in, seemingly in the 18th century, uh, that has two aspects of it. And the relationship between those two aspects has been debated, is being debated. One of those aspects is the growth of humane feelings. Uh, this is particularly in Britain, although not exclusively in Britain, uh, but pretty close to exclusively in Britain. It has to do with feelings that grow among the most, um, uh, the most enlightened segments of the society, that it's wrong to simply kill animals wantonly. Uh, Britain probably had more wanton killing of animals than of the, any other country in Europe from what we, we know of that period. The idea of simply enjoying watching animals kill each other or enjoying killing the animals yourselves uh, was, uh, was intense in Britain. Um, and it had lost the quasi-military rationale that it had in earlier centuries, where you would have a, a hunt that was supposed to keep your army on its toes. And also the great hunts of earlier times uh, sent, you know, desensitized people to, to killing another animal up close and personal, that if you, you know, bash a deer on the head, then you may just as easily bash a human on the head. But in Britain in the, ninth, in the 18th century, uh, say tying up a bull and setting dogs on it, um, or a bear bull baiting and bear baiting, things like that, gradually were seen to be pretty hideous practices. And there's a great deal written on the growth of humane feeling in Britain. But there's a simultaneous thing that is growing uh, in other parts of the world, but primarily in parts of the world inhabited by people who speak English. Uh, that is to say, the United States, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And this is the growth of the ranching industry. Uh, ranching and pastoral nomadism have similarities in that you have huge quantities of animals taken care of by a very small number of people on range land that is not suitable for agriculture. The difference is that with a uh, pastoral nomadic society, every animal is valuable uh, in its lifetime because the quantity of your wealth, like the quantity of your, uh, of your gold coins, is um, uh, defined by how many animals you have. In the New World, which had no domestic animals, that had huge amounts of space that animals could live in, uh, and, the, and the animals that the Europeans brought um, reproduced with incredible abundance in Canada, United States, uh, Mexico, and uh, Argentina in particular, 
Um, most of the animals couldn't possibly be used. And it's a, it was a very unusual situation. You had, let's say, probably millions of animals that um, you know, the majority of which were not owned by anybody. Every animal in the, old, in the old world was owned, every domestic animal. And in the new world, most of them were not owned. And there was no way to, the people did not see them as sources of wealth on the hoof. Uh, they only became sources of wealth when you sold their parts. So the ranching industry grows up uh, making its money, you know, you know, realizing its wealth through the killing and dismemberment of animals rather than through maintaining them as wild, uh, wild livestock. No society that has had, no country that's had a, a large and active uh, pastoral nomadic society has yet succeeded in converting their animal husbandry to a ranching society because it's, they're just contradictory. Ranching says kill animals, sell the pieces, and have pastoral nomadism says, you know, hold the animals, uh, help them reproduce, and you increase your wealth. Two different, entirely different concepts of wealth. But the ranching fed into the growing humane feelings. The idea that it is, um, that just killing animals because they're sort of machines or they're just products um, is bad uh, because it's inhumane. And yet on the other hand, world uh, history has shown in modern times that every time you have a significant increase in per capita income, uh, meat eating increases. So ranching gets bigger and bigger and bigger, particularly once you get uh, refrigeration and salting and other uh, ways of preserving meat and, and distributing it. Uh, the, the overlapping, particularly in the English-speaking world, of ranching, uh, that is to say the um, produ production of a maximum amount of meat and the realization of wealth by killing animals uh, comes into contradiction with the idea of humane treatment of animals. And this grows in the 19th century and particularly in the 20th century. And this, to my mind, is where we come to the end of the road for the whole concept of domestic animals. Because domesticity uh, has created uh, irresolvable conflicts that are moral, that are intellectual, in which you have people who profoundly believe that it is wrong to kill animals and eat them, uh, particularly domestic animals. Uh, and yet at the same time, the society is producing more and more uh, meat. Uh, in the post-World War II era in, uh, in the United States and uh, in particular, you have a profound separation between humans and animals so that meat is no longer uh, you know, cut from a, you know, from a, a hanging piece of a carcass, but is rather packaged uh, on a plastic tray and covered with, uh, with, with uh, transparent film. Um, you no longer have people living on farms. You no longer have horses uh, pulling vehicles in cities. You've gotten to a point where there is virtually no contact between humans and animals except for pets, particularly dogs, horses, and uh, cats. And um, in uh, fiction, movies, television, cartoons, and so forth. That, is, that becomes the new locus of human-animal relations. It is in this context that you start to get the development of uh, what I call sort of post-domestic uh, anxieties. Um, people who feel that the issue of, of animal rights or animal pain or animal exploitation is 
uh, as important in their view of the world as, uh, as human rights or human pain or human exploitation. So the animal rights movement becomes uh, the uh, political spearhead of the post-domestic uh, era. I apologize for introducing another post word. We have a lot of post words. But this one is rather interesting because it isn't simply a matter of humaneness and, and uh, industrial exploitation of animals coming together to produce a revulsion and feelings of guilt, but it also opens a new chapter in people's effort to understand the relationship between humans and animals. So you actually have, if you come up to the post-domestic era, you have a reversion to an earlier time as people begin to say, how are we different from animals? And people become fascinated by things like, how do animals communicate? How does human speech relate to, uh, to animal vocalization? Um, does the organization of human society in some ways mirror the organization of termite or ant society or the organization of chimpanzee society? Uh, maybe we need to study chimpanzees and orangutans and so forth with intense interest because they're, they're who we used to be. Um, and some people will, uh, will go to, uh, to, to extremes, I would say, in trying to reconnect uh, the severance between humans and animals that comes in in this late period of domestic uh, uh, existence. Uh, this has a carryover into the area of religion in which people try to reinterpret their religious traditions in ways that will be pro-vegetarian and uh, humane to animals. Um, so that if the Torah says that you shall not work on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, it also says neither should your animal work on the Sabbath. As if your animal was going to work, go to work without you. You know, you were, I'll take the Sabbath off, but you know, bossy, you go out there and plow all by yourself. It's not quite clear what was all meant by that. Um, but it's very hard to, to get away from the fact that ancient Judaism had blood sacrifice and that if the temple is ever uh, rebuilt on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, there will be blood sacrifice again. And then, you know, huge numbers of Americans will say, ew, they're, you know, they're slaughtering animals uh, in Jerusalem. Why did we work so hard to get that temple rebuilt? Um, I got an email once from a person who read my book on animals. And he, uh, you know, actually it wasn't an email, it was a review. And he said, it was a really interesting book, learned all sorts of important things I wish I read a long time ago. But then I discovered that the author is profoundly wrong uh, on certain things. For example, he denies that Jesus and the disciples are vegetarians. Uh, and I thought, gee, the loaves and the fishes. That's not the loaves and the dofu meat substitute. Those are loaves and fishes. Um, and what is Jesus? Jesus is the Lamb of God who sacrificed for you and for many. And when you take the cup, you know, this is my blood. You take the, the bread, this is my body. And yet, this is now being recast as a vegetarian uh, tradition. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, you have the idea that pets are really um, pretty much human. They're, you know, you relate to your pet in the 21st century as closely as you relate to that sister you've never liked very much. Matter of fact, you're much closer to your pet. Your pet always understands you, you understand the pet. So in America, um, a legend was started about 50 years ago that um, when your pet dies, and you'll find this 
in any handout from a pet cemetery or a, a pet grief counseling officer or anything like that. When your pet dies, it goes to the Rainbow Bridge. And the Rainbow Bridge is a sunny meadow where your pet will play and gamble in the sunshine uh, all day long, every day, until one day it sees you coming over the horizon. And it runs and it leaps into your arms and you cross the Rainbow Bridge together into paradise. Um, you know, check it out in Google. Look how many hits you get for Rainbow Bridge. And they're all American. This was an anonymous essay written by a pet lover about 50 years ago, published in a pet magazine, and it sort of went viral in the, pre, uh, in the, in the pre-YouTube era. And um, so now it's used all over the place. Because the idea that you would, uh, that you would not be with your pet is, you know, you, it, that's, that's not what the hereafter is for. And so you can read books like Boy Jesus and His Dog. Um, you can also buy the sweatshirt on the internet. Uh, Boy Jesus, there's a dog whom he converts to, uh, to be his friend. Then the dog goes back to its original owner and uh, uh, who is someone who was imprisoned and tortured by the Romans for his belief in the Messiah. And then finally the owner is dying and, um, and Jesus now comes and reconnects with the dog and the owner says, I just uh, hoped I'd live long enough to see the Messiah. And Jesus says, you have. And so Mary and Joseph are like, what, what? You're the Messiah? I never knew. But the dog knew. And then Jesus and the dog are going to, it says, Jesus and the dog will be in, in, in heaven together. Um, now, these are things that would have been utterly inconceivable 200 years ago. And while most societies in the, in the world are not engaged in this sort of uh, post-domestic set of strange uh, attitudes, uh, it's growing in America and growing even faster in Britain and is likely, I think, in the, uh, over the next couple of decades to become the successor to, uh, you know, freeing the slaves, uh, getting women the vote, uh, civil rights movement, uh, you know, gay and lesbian uh, equality, and animal rights. And my guess is that animal rights is going to emerge um, at the next stage in world history as an international issue. It's like right now where you have someone saying, well, we wouldn't want to have Muslims win a vote in Egypt because they would uh, abolish drinking and oppress women. Uh, okay, that can be debated. But we may get to the point in 20 years where I'd say, well, we wouldn't want the exes to come to power in country Y because they'll kill animals and we need to protect the animals. So as a theme in world history, this is one that is global. It has stages. It has dramatic events. It has crucial texts. It has important individuals. And it's undergone a profound change literally during, uh, during our lifetimes as post-domestic anxieties have emerged uh, as being so important to a uh, major segment of the American community. But you can't do this kind of world history in something that's called world history. Because world history is supposed to be about people. And this is about people and animals together. But it's only one of a score of different world histories that might be imagined that would not be um, modeled implicitly although not explicitly, on the evolution of politics and the evolution of, of, um, of the economy, which is what we have in the um, world history narratives that are before us, not only in my textbook, but in other textbooks and in most of the uh, trade books related to world history that are available. So that's the capsule history of human-animal relations. Um, if you want details, I have a book called
uh, hunters, herders, and hamburgers. That gives this all at uh, exhaustive detail. Not exhaustive, uh, delightful detail. Um, and on Thursday, I will uh, give a final uh, lecture about world history to finish the course. And I woke up at 3.18 in the morning this morning with the idea for the lecture. <laughs> so um, I'll see you all then.